ladies and gentlemen, the joke doctor, Mr. Cherry Corley. Yes. Hey, look at that. See, I love how the big face just comes in there. just like a boom. Yeah. Ooh, like there the, we go. The head. Look at that. Now you're the now oh. you're the head of the pack now. This is I yeah. am so jazzed about this one. I mean, like, there's so much, as Jerry says, synergy between the hot breath of verse and what he's doing. And so many people are in both worlds. And it's just it's it's all about positivity and being supportive in people's comedy's journeys. So it it's only right that you're our our headliner of this pro talk. <laughs> oh, that's such a you know, such an honor, man, to be part of this. First of all, it's a community. You you formed such a cool community. You give it a nickname, Hot Breath, and it's like most comics they try to ho you know hide their breath because it's like <laughs> we're basically coffee and alcohol. It's like anybody <laughs> smells this breath, they're gonna pass out. And it's like, and, but you're like Hot Breath. Let's put it on people. We're all Hot Breath. We're and it's like, in. first of all, awesome, right? And it's like. When I first met you at the World Series of Comedy, you were doing a podcast seminar. Mm -hmm. And then we got to chat afterwards. And I loved what you were doing there. I go, this guy really gives a shit. Look at this. This is like <laughs> cool, right? It's you're not just there for yourself. And it's like, that's why, you know, you do festivals and shit. You don't just do it to win. You do it to build that network of, of like-minded people and build yep. relationships. Mm -hmm. Nothing exactly. is done in this business without relationships. Then we talked about... Afterwards, we did our interview that wound up going like two hours and 10 minutes or something like that. It was, ridiculous. It was like two hours. Yeah. yeah. It was just like so much fun. The time just flew by. And then, um, um, and then, then we were like every, and I was when, during the, when the uh, pandemic hit, I moved, mm -hmm. had to move everything online. And then I was doing, I said, what can I do to help out? Uh, and I did like these, I do these a la carte classes and we yeah. started them at like 25 bucks a class mm -hmm. just to make it affordable for people to keep, going back to something to keep doing their thing and give out like a three hour class. And then uh, that was going well. And every, every time we'd mention hot breath and uh, check out Joel Byers, uh, the, the right 10 club is like, you want to account, have accountability, go to the right 10 club. And it's like, people were like, Oh, okay. And they're writing that down. And it's like, does it take away from me? No. Cause I just gave them a value point. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. And they're like, Oh, that's great information. They go check you out. They go, Hey, this guy really loves what he's doing. It's like, and then, then there's, and then Bo, I remember Bo started put heaps when I got the, the second interview arranged, mm -hmm. right? On Twitter. And yeah, back in August. Man, you were yeah. like, when you said, you said this at the beginning, you're like, oh, you're like the, the wind beneath my wings. So it's like, yeah, he's like the, <laughs> he's like the, the, the engines that fly the plane, you know? Totally. <laughs> it's, and it's been amazing. Like when you talk about community is just like giving comics a safe space to try and do things and experiment. It's just giving people the opportunity to like fail upward, like try it yeah, out because and we'll laugh when you fail of because course. we're laughing at ourselves, too. Yeah. It's, oh, man, yeah. I did that. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes in my classes, when somebody like bombs a joke and it sits there, I laugh because yeah. I'm like, oh, I know I've been there. Yeah, right? yeah. And then so they feel because you laugh like now, what do you do with your friends? That exact thing. If your friend fails, you're going to laugh at it. Right. If I got all protective, people would be like. Okay, this makes me even feel more nervous. But if you laugh and make it okay, people are like, all right, all right, we can risk here mm -hmm. and nobody's gonna judge us. They're just gonna laugh with us. And what and then here, and then you laugh and then give them a fix for the joke. And it's like, oh, here's what's missing. What are you trying to say with that joke? I'm trying to say this. Oh, well, why don't you put this in? You're missing a connector. Put this in, that'll tie those two together. And all of a sudden they're like, boom, the joke works. And they go, How'd you do that? That's why I'm the joke doctor. No, I know. I, I didn't even name myself the joke doctor. Somebody else did. Some old veteran. He was like, oh, man, you make jokes well. You're the joke doctor. We were going to throw those jokes out. And you just like, hey, what if you did this? I'm curious, like as, as someone like I've, I've been doing like coaching with comics and like workshops and stuff. I'm curious. How did you come up with like your terminology? Like how like I can explain to people like here's how this joke could be better. But like. There's, I don't have like a tangible way of like describing it in terms or like a system, you know, like how did you develop a system to like clearly communicate a process? Well, two things happened that uh, first of all, when I met George Carlin way back in the day, um, it was a crazy coincidental meeting. He actually gave me a ride to the airport uh, in his car that had picked him up. And I had just finished my one of I did a corporate my one of my first corporates in New York City and I was waiting for my car and it was late and then uh, uh, he was there and he hey you uh, you need a ride and I was like <laughs> that guy looks like George Carlin and I said oh well if it's not an imposition you're going to the airport right uh, JFK I said uh, yes sir he says uh, ride with me and, okay so I get in there he goes my name's George and I'm like oh shit it is 
And, uh, you know, so we rode to the airport. We, it turns out his his agent had recommended that he watch my dad, who's a character actor at the time, so that he can learn to be a better character actor. And then they had the same agent and we started a conversation. And then um, uh, kind of he just said, hey, anytime you uh, see me, come say hello if, if you see me somewhere. And I did. And we wound up talking. And one of the things he said was... Um, um, you know, he said that I know with 98% accuracy that a joke is funny before I step on stage. And I said, how do you know that? He said, because it contains all the necessary elements for a joke to be funny. And I was like, what are those elements? And he says, you're going to have to learn those on your own kid. <laughs> and then after a glass of wine and a painkiller, which yeah. was his drug of choice at the time, he said, I think the reason I say that is because intuitively I know what they are, but I can't verbalize it. Yeah. Uh, that, that'll be your job. You do that. Yeah, And you can tell everybody how it works. And so I took it as a command. It was an order. That's an order. So I said, I've got to do this. George said, I got to do this. So um, I started to look around and do some research. And the first set of, uh, you know, sort of the ideas and the, and the labels I came across was from Melvin Hellitzer, who wrote a book called Comedy Writing Secrets. Now, Melvin, it was a journalism professor at Ohio University. And he used to do a humor class where he had a, like a two-year waiting list. And, um, and so in that book, he had some basic labels. And so I started work off of those labels. Uh -huh. And I said, well, this one works for, the, for me, but this one doesn't. Now, the thing is, he's a journalism professor. And he put a piece. And what I realized is his book was built off of a Gene Parrott's book, Joke Writing Step by Step. Gene Parrott was Bob Hope's head writer. And so, uh, but I had studied with uh, Gene Parrott uh, for two years. And after I read Melvin's book, and that's what got me my job on The Tonight Show. So uh, writing for Jay. But those labels help you to keep things, keep track of things. Gotcha. And they help you to, um, uh, when you're going back through your material, you go, okay, the nine elements that uh, psychological laughter triggers I wound up coming back with were surprise, superiority, embarrassment, recognition, incongruity, ambivalence, uh, configurational, and coincidence. I added coincidence late because I was like, it's even bigger than surprise. It's one of those where you go, oh, shit, I never thought about it that way. Uh -huh. That's that coincidence. And sometimes if you do an analogy, like you do an analogy and say my ex-wife, she was an alcoholic. She was sort of like a smartphone. At any given point, I could usually find her at at least one bar. And people go, oh, <laughs> shit, yeah, I never thought about it that way. That's so true. Gotcha. And it's like that is a coincidence that, that two, those two dissimilar ideas were actually similar. So we're actually laughing at that coincidence, plus we recognize those two elements. And you put them on a hook with an illogical equation of my ex-wife was like a smartphone. Huh? Solve that for us. Show us how that's true. And when you say that you watch an audience, any comedian says an analogy to an audience like that, they sit up and they're like, they get focused. They're like, oh, wait, what? How? And then you solve it for them. First of all, you release that tension because you solved that illogical, illogical equation. Then you solve it with a nuance that, oh, shit, that matches. And they go, what a, wow, what a coincidence. You know? Yeah, that's seeing that. Like when I give people feedback, I'll be like, they some people will set up an analogy and then never deliver on it as well. Like they they they're in there, but they don't fit <laughs> to build on it, you know. So I can right. be like, Oh, you set up an analogy there. Now you could use a Venn diagram to compare and contrast and find the parallels, but I don't have like a use this catchy phrase, you know. Like, I don't, I mean, maybe I don't need to. I'm just I was just thinking about that as I was looking at how effective you're teaching it and why so many people in the hot breath of verse, take value in it and take advantage of all your courses and book and everything is I was like, he communicates it so clearly. And it's like, I can tell people through that like description. Oh, I see an analogy there. You could use a Venn diagram, but I don't have like a use blah, you know, but maybe I don't. Well, need. you know, sometimes when, as you like, it's like music, right? When you learn first, you learn music. And when you're first learning, you're uh, playing guitar, you're playing your, you learn your scales and then from your scales, you learn chord shapes. And then from those chord shapes, you learn power chords. Oh, that sounds kind of cool. And then you learn uh, these interesting chord shapes that give you a more percussive sound. And then you learn, you know, you learn how to do, do the, 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 the stroke that's a shuffle stroke that gives you that little crisp sort of like, you know, and it sounds cool, sounds cooler. Now I'm sounding like some of the people I've actually heard play. And then as you're learning more and you start developing your style, 
you go back and use these other ones just almost automatically. And then the hammer on, you know, is out is like a, it gives it a different uh, texture. And so as you're learning these things before, when you first started scales, you didn't know what the, uh, I did my own radio edit there. Did you see that? I went, you don't, know what the, I, you don't know what the hell a, uh, a hammer on was, but now that you know it now it's not, it's like buying a car. You didn't see that car before, and then you bought the car, and you see that car everywhere. So mm -hmm. now you have the hammer on. You know you could use it. So when you know a reverse is there, you played with the reverse. You've learned to write a reverse. You know you could take a sentence. If you're writing story-based comedy, just put the story on the page first. Then go line by line and find some of the humor in each of the lines. Like you say the line, does it, is there an assumption, an expectation, or an image I can shatter? Is there a, two dissimilar ideas converging for I can do an incongruity joke or an associative joke? Is there, uh, are there, is there some wordplay? So those are the first three questions I would ask. Mm -hmm. And then you could go on from there and go, is there some irony present? Is there paradox? You know? So once you have those tools in your sort of bag of tricks, yeah. you can take any logical grouping of words pretty much and make it funny. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I really just push people to get like personal and I'm like, what jokes could you write that no one else could create? You know, like what wouldn't be like a fortune cookie or a popsicle joke. So I'm, I'm always pushing people to get more personal. So, I mean, every, yeah, everyone has different styles. I just see how effective your way. And we'll get to your questions too. I'm like selfishly like, how do I help communicate more clearly, Jerry? Um, but I guess, I guess it's working if people get results from it. I, I guess I'm just thinking of, how can there be a clever system or something? You know, but. there is a there is a couple of clever systems. Like that one, I you know, one of my first videos I put out was uh called Joke Writing One Two Three. Like it's just getting started. Where do I even get the ideas? Mm -hmm. Hey, where do I where do I get the ideas to write something funny? Stop writing something funny. Stop trying to think of something funny. Just write something and then make it funny. Yes. Once you have it on the page, you can control it. I remember this one dude, he sold the course and uh, bless his heart. He used to be like, uh, he goes, uh, and he was from Kentucky, right? And he was like, uh, he was like, you know, you know, you know, the, you know, the easiest way to stop being funny. That's how we talked. I'm not making, this is exactly his voice. <laughs> I practiced it. He's like, uh, he goes, you know how to, the easiest way to not be funny, write your material. Because if you write it, it's on a page. It's one dimensional. Wow. It's like, that's stupid. No. It's like, you then you're removing the element of how important the craft is, right? Every script in Hollywood is one dimensional. Right. It's like, I dare you to call Tom Hanks a one dimensional actor, right? It's like, no, he's, <laughs> you take those words and all of a sudden Matt McConaughey and that thing he did on Wolf of Wall Street, he was in the beginning part, only like a couple of scenes. And he was nominated for an Oscar because he took that little simple role and just all of a sudden give it this, all this nuance and crazy Matt McConaughey shit. You know, and uh, so that's that's your craft. Now you have to bring it on stage and communicate it in a way by being completely present with the audience. Yeah. And then all of a sudden that joke evolves from a joke to an experience because that's like the second or third draft. You write it on the page. That's one draft. You put it up on the stage that evolves into a whole nother draft of a joke, you know, because now you're looking at the audience. They're nodding. So you're communicating with them and then you're responding off of what they you know, what they think of the. What's their, what do they think? And I'm going to respond off their, their response. And it's nonverbal. It's just like, ha ha, you know, oh yeah. And then such and such happens. That's a tag or a topper, you know, and then you add the act out. I know it seems like I'm on cocaine, but I just have a, a nose hair that's itching me. I just, <laughs> we talk about this. I just get jacked up. That's all there is to it. Hey, that's a, that's a great, that's a great problem to have. So with new comedians, since the last time we've talked, we've actually had a lot of new comedians, um, new to yeah. the game join the group mm -hmm. so what advice do you give to any new comedian that's just getting started okay so one of the things is like uh, um check out the videos right check out the uh the youtube videos because yeah. i give away a lot of shit. i'm gonna go getting back to doing more videos too so i have been, i've been away from that for a little while um just moving everything online got kind of overwhelming and it's just you know me and my assistant and that's it you know i don't have a crew like you got a crew Right. You got you got Bo. He handles everything. This guy, look at the look at the look at the shoulders on this. Thing. He's the heavy lifter. You know, you Joe, you got dress shirts on. You're like, oh, don't get my hands dirty. I've I got mean, shit you know, to do. My, my part is perfect. It, uh... My hair, fuck you and your hair. <laughs> right. It's like you got hair. You're just jealous of hair. Yeah, that's I am. It's a jealousy with hair. <laughs> but, but here's the advice. Check out the videos, right? That's a start. Then what I would do is just write sentences, write facts about you. Just facts about me. 
One dude in my class wrote lazy, one word. Yeah, obviously you wrote one fucking word, but it's like, you know, but what if we add an element to that? What if we add a descriptor to lazy? Lazy at what? Who, what, where, why, when, and how? You know, the, the you know, ask the maximum of the five W's. Sort of asking questions. Who, what, where, why, when, and how? Lazy at what? What would be really embarrassing, embarrassment as a laughter trigger, to be lazy at? That's a question for you, Jill, or Bo. What would be embarrassing to be lazy at? Really embarrassing to be lazy at. Sex. Absolutely, right? Oh. I'm a lazy lover. All of a sudden, that statement takes on a whole new flair, doesn't it? It's no longer, I'm lazy. I'm lazy at sex. I'm a lazy lover. Mm -hmm. So if you're lazy at lover uh, in bed at sex, what, uh, who, what, where, why, when, and how positions, what would be your pos favorite position if you're lazy at sex? A nap, right? <laughs> My favorite. So I'm a dude. I'm a anybody a lover here? You guys, good lovers. You think it's a good lover? It's like it's like I'm a lazy lover. Like my favorite position is a nap. You know. Now you have a quick joke, and it's just from a fact about you. You can even build that out even farther by asking more questions. What else is in sex? What else is in sex that is like, uh, you know, I when I masturbate, I'm like, it's just not worth it. You know, now you have a joke that comes out of that, right? So it's not even, it's not even, uh, you know, it's just what happens when you're, what do you, how do you respond to stuff when you're lazy? It's like, you like, you don't even, if you're really tired or you're lazy, you don't even want to, I got to pee, but I'm not going to get out of bed right now. I'm just going to go to sleep. Maybe I'll still hold it throughout the night. Sullivan wanna... said childbirth. <laughs> yeah, child... lazy childbirth. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's funny. That's so funny. Oh God. Oh, hilarious. <laughs> That's that, so that, that one actually has me thinking. Like, wait a minute, that's possible? Yeah, lazy. La yeah, that's why they give do C sections. <laughs> ah, wow. or lazy it's like, sections. Oh, she can't. She I'm, she yeah, lazy sections. So, they don't even I'm call so, them C yeah, sections. Lazy. They call them lazy sections. Yeah, and it's like because uh, it's like she's not pushing. She doesn't know how to push. She's not pushing. She doesn't want to push. She's not going to push the baby out in time. We got to get the baby out. All right, we're gonna have to section her. All of a sudden, and the it turns into an operating room. And they cut her open and take out a baby. I know I've seen two of them. I have five kids. Did I tell you guys that? Wow. What? Because I'm only that? half Mormon. Yeah. I'm... You have five kids? <laughs> five kids from two different moms. Oh my. God. I'm sorry. Three different moms. You're like yeah, Johnny Appleseed moms. out here. Yeah. He, doesn't, he doesn't even look like he's in the NBA, right? <laughs> Five. Every time I say that, people groan. I go, what? What happened? Somebody what? goes, oh, that's racist. I go, why? You said NBA. I go, so how's that racist? And then I let them configure it, and they go, well, uh, because um, uh, you see black people are in the Who's making the stereotypes now? So really? Right. You're going to jump to me being racist, and yep. you're the one generalizing? Yeah. I love Five putting more. people in that trap, that PC trap. Five more kids, he gets a Barrett badge. That's right. You know, my dad had six, so I'm trying to reach that goal. <clears throat> Goodness. Like father, so, like son. So when people start, start writing facts about you. That's one way. Now, remember, George Carl and Jerry Seinfeld didn't do anything about themselves. Everything was outside of themselves. So if you're afraid, because when I started, every I was doing observational stuff. Because George said to me, take the shit that drives you crazy, make it funny. Mm. And I was like, oh, yeah. Then there's a catharsis. He goes, you ever watch the newspaper? You read the newspaper, watch TV, and you call bullshit when you're watching the news or something? I go, mm -hmm. all the time. He goes, make those your jokes. He said, but make them funny. And what, you know what the trick he gave me was? He's like, raise the bridge. If you raise the eyebrows, you can't be mad. <laughs> it's got to be absurd or ridiculous or confusing, right? J John Stewart used to use that all the time. He used to be like, what's going on? Why? And wow. so it made it more palatable for people to listen to, even like the real sensitive kind of tension, the divisive uh, subject matters, because it's, you were asking questions about it. It's like Bill Burr. Somebody explain it. it. Doesn't make any sense. Somebody explain this to me. How does this work? So even though he's very strongly committed emotionally to his material and he's ranting about it, he's very focused on his point of view. It's still all based in, I can't figure it. Somebody explain it. Doesn't make any sense. And that's how he walks through. And that's how he was able to walk that line of being firmly committed to something that may seem misogynistic or, you know, sometimes even sexist. <laughs> really? Bill Bird? No, tell me it's not true. And I love Bill <laughs> Bird, but he doesn't, sometimes he doesn't even know he's sexist, you know? I mean, and, and that's kind of an interesting thing that you, you brought that up because we were having that discussion last night is sometimes it's not the joke that's the problem. It's the look you give. 
Like that one little look can probably make or break your joke or probably. Yeah. You convey something through your emotion as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So in there, I, in my book, I have this thing called the, the teaser formula, which I stole directly from Melvin Hellitzer, but I changed it a little bit based on my experience as a standup. You know, his experience was as a journalism professor trying to convey this in a communicative way to people on how to write humor. And mine was taking those that the core ideas I got from him and from Gene Parrott and then going up on stage. And Gene was a writer, right? It wasn't a stand-up. Then I was on the road 43 weeks out of the year. And every night I was in front of an audience, I'd have a hypothesis or I have an idea I want to try in front of an audience, try that, uh, try that. And then I'd listen to the audio later and write the notes on it on how it worked. So that's kind of, I was using the comedy clubs as my lab. So, and every night I'd put the ear pods on, listen to the audio, write the notes. And it was like, uh, sort of like, so the audience didn't even know they were my guinea pigs. Nah. So for trying this stuff, I mean, I was having fun with them, but at the same time I realized, wait a second, the joke is only half of it. Then there's the, the teaser formula, t you know, T-E-A-S-E-R, target. You have to know what you're making fun of. You have to have a specific target. Sometimes that's what's lacking. We're not sure what we're making the joke about. Is it mm -hmm. a joke about a concept? Is it about a person? Is it about an entity? Is it about, you know, this magazine article? Is it about the psychologist who said something ridiculous? You know, a lot of times we'll just do this bland thing and we'll go like, well, who are we making fun of here? What's what's so? And then the second thing is like, so, so target, know what you're making fun of. Right. And so, and, and, you know, sometimes w as we write the joke, we don't know exactly who we're making fun of. And then we go, oh, this is not about the president. This is about the Congress, or this is about the law, or this is about racism, or this is about, you know, immigration or, or the decisions made or whatever. But we got to know who we talk, or the audience has to know who we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's target. And then there's emotion. This is where so many comics fail is you said the facial expression. The facial expression isn't just a facial expression. It comes from an inspiration or motivation or a moment, right? And this is why I learned so much about acting in stand-up. I remember doing my, in acting class, I took, you know, I studied at uh, the Juilliard uh, acting, uh, summer acting program um, for years. And then I was at the actor studio and then at Lee Strasberg Theater Institute. And one of my favorite instructors, I loved her because she would break through all my bullshit defense mechanisms, my tricks. It's like, she goes, oh, Jerry, so uh, you're doing stand up. That's so great. Could you do five minutes for the class? And I go, yeah, I'm going to knock this out of the park. Watch this shit. Right. Because I write great comedy. I, I'm, I'm good with my words. You know, I have the best words, the best words. <laughs> ah! So I get up on I get up on the stage and I do the jokes for the five minutes, and I know the jokes are good. The audience is laughing, the class is laughing. They're like, "Yeah, right, good jokes." My teacher sits there with her arms folded, her legs crossed, and she says, "Oh, look, Jerry thinks his jokes are so clever he doesn't need to perform them." Mm. And I went, "What do you mean by that?" Because my dad, brilliant, he was my coach too. He used to, anytime I filibustered him, because I hated to be wrong, man. I didn't, I needed to be perfect in front of my dad. And I'd always be, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I got it. I got it. Whatever. Yeah, I got it. I got what you're saying. And he said, son, anytime I give you a note, I want you to follow it up with two questions. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, I totally got it. Two questions. Got it, got it. Oh, shit. That means I have to listen to the note. Right. You know, these we, we we're sometimes those people. We don't want to be seen as flawed. Right. So yeah. but our students do this all the time. They'll like mm -hmm. jump on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally. Oh, yeah. I know. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. They don't really want to listen and acknowledge that they made a mistake. But then you learn that mistakes are gold. So it'd be like now when my te someone teacher said, oh, look, Jerry thinks his jokes are so clever. He doesn't need to perform them. I was like, oh, what do you mean by that? And how can I improve that? Now it's no longer a critique. It's a collaboration. Mm -hmm. you're collaborating, you're creating together now because he'll now he'll give you a follow-up and then it's like, oh yeah, oh, I see it. And maybe he hits that one note that flips the switch and makes you go, how come I didn't see that before? Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 I got it now, I got it now. Go away, I got it, I got that. Yeah, you flip the switch, right? And so she said, take the same five minutes, go home, write down your emotional through lines for each of those jokes. What are you trying to say? What's your expressive, mm -hmm. what do you, and respond to each joke. Now, what I learned was watch Friends, the, the television show. The reason it got so many laughs was the directors and the editors, along with this terrific ensemble and the terrific writing, they knew that the jokes, the laughs didn't just come on the joke. 
it came on the reactions to the joke where you had the other people react and they, they react off the reaction. So in standup, we are our own reaction shot. Mm -hmm. So they had the other angle get Joey's reaction to that joke. And that's the second laugh. And then Phoebe's reaction to the joke. That's a third laugh. But on stage, we are Joey. We are Phoebe. So we're reacting. How did he say that? I don't know why he said that. Is that weird? <sighs> that kind of thing. So we have all these inspirations that come. The facial expressions happen as a result of some emotion. And we all have these emotions when we're in a conversation at a party. Mm. So it's like, you don't have to make up shit. It's all right there. Sometimes in the mechanics, you can build in a deadpan. Like you want to give them something, just sit there. Like, um, you know, you have something configurational, just stare at them for a moment, you know, and just wait for them to respond. But um, so that emotion, that, 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 that mechanical look that comes from some sort of, like when uh, Esther Hirsch, she's like in her 70s, she does like, a, she goes, dating at my age is hard because my men aren't. Mm. Ah. She scans across the room at very Jonathan Winters, right? And she gets a huge laugh. It's a, what a difference in the laugh. She does it without that little slow burn. She doesn't get it as big a laugh. She does that slow burn, applause break, you know? So mm. it really does, because that sort of conveys her emotion. Can you believe that shit, you know? All these yeah. guys with ED, it's like, all I want to do is fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, slowing down is such an important like thing comics struggle with, especially early on, because that's people think you got to get all the jokes out, but really slowing down, that timing, that pacing is where a lot of the humor comes from. Mm -hmm. That patience. Yeah. <gasps> Breathe. And listen to what their response is. Yes. And then you can respond off their response. Yep. Yeah, but like you, if I was like just doing that joke, jokes. what's that, Joel? Say it's it almost like you got to know the jokes so you're not in your head like, what's next? What am I thinking? What are the next words? Knowing the jokes will free you up to listen as well. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. When you know the jokes, then you're not so worried. But you're not in your head anymore. You're mm -hmm. present with the audience. Like, yep. you know, and it's like you say a joke. It's like, what are they thinking? A lot of times when I write a joke, I'll write the joke with what the response might be if it was a conversation. And then I wound up, that's where the tags and talker, toppers come from. Oh, interesting. And uh, I think mm -hmm. we have people asking questions. What yeah. was the rest of the teaser thing? You said target so, emotion. So T-E-A, A stands for antagonism. That's okay. where the kind of the jokes come from. You were antagonized in some way. It doesn't mean angered. It means you were confused by something, curious about something. What is it with bugs? You know, that's Jerry Seinfeld's antagonism. You know, um, you know, uh, Bill Burr talking about like, uh, you know, divorce or this ridiculous, like, are women's really, women are always right? I don't think so, right? So that that annoyed him. So he spoke on that. And it's like, so what, take the shit that drives you crazy, make it funny, right? Or take the mm -hmm. shit that confuses you, makes you funny. Take the shit that's, uh, that sounds hypocritical, make it funny. Or that sounds, uh, that's ridiculous. Or, you know, um, or, you know, surprises you, you know? Or a lot of times I'll just sit there because I know sometimes the structure, I can just write a joke off a of structure. And it's like yesterday was my wife's birthday. And for her birthday, I got her a gift certificate for his and her massage. And she said, Jerry, this is a we gift, not a me gift. So I returned it and got her a gift certificate for dinner for one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I know I can utilize the paired phrase to heighten the expectation and get a laugh. So it's like knowing the mechanics and what you can use is like knowing what notes to play in a certain chord progression, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's part of the, that's, that's part of the evolution of your mastery of the comedy is like knowing what works, why it works. I remember I was coaching some guy. I think he's like, he came to me through you, Joel. And uh, every time I say Joel, I want to say Embo, Joel and Bo. <laughs> sounds like, you know, sounds like Mattel's little, like, hey, we need to extend the Barbie line. We've got Ken. We need a Joel and Bo. And it's like, what cars do they drive? You know, <laughs> we're a very so, progressive couple, Bo. So <laughs> Matt had a question. It was a really great question, and it was like he talked about something that happened to him back in the sixth grade. Let me finish that thing. Oh, so, the teaser, yeah. so T E A, target emotion antagonism surprise, mm -hmm. and then the last two are very important. You know, it's exaggeration and realism. Those two work together. Comedy is heightened reality. It's not necessarily complete unimplausible absurdity because then we go that would never happen 
you know, you can build to that. Like, you know, when Dennis Wolfberg talks about his wife having a baby and the baby comes out, but then it's not just the baby that comes out. It's uh, <laughs> other stuff, right? And it's like, it's just a placenta. It's like, it's just, and there's like it's blood and there's a, then a big, huge baby comes out and there's a placenta and there's blood and there's and then a tricycle, right? And it's like in his crazy, he's so like, wow, what's coming out of there? A tricycle now makes sense to him because he's built up the, uh, he's like, this is crazy. Yeah. And we accept the tricycle as we suspend our disbelief and accept the tricycle. So the antag antagonism, that's kind of like what some people would say would be the um, attitude. It's Inspiration, inspiration where the joke okay. comes from okay like if you're driving around you see something you go authentic chinese cuisine say habla espanol what how do they speak in spanish if it's authentic chinese <laughs> right it's like i'll have the chicken chow mein with the dirty sanchez can i get those <laughs> dirty sanchez you know so that's what you see something sometimes and that in, and mm -hmm. inspires you or confuses you or antagonizes you to write it down and say i got to talk about this this has affected me emotionally so the emotion is where your angle comes from your attitude or your point of view it's like how do i feel about this it's like like if i'm like a writer and i'm just go to my editor and I say i want to write a story on the homeless they're going to say, what's the angle? Mm. And you're going to be like, oh, man, they're they're crapping up the neighborhood with their RVs and their garbage. That's one angle. You know, my heart, I'm a bleeding heart liberal. I want to take care of everybody. You know, that's the way I was raised. I'd be like, well, I'd feel so bad for them because so many of them have been, have been priced out of their homes because the rental prices here in L.A. are ridiculous. Right. The rental's going through the roof, but nobody's getting no salaries are going through the roof. We got to remedy that. And so that's the angle. So that's a whole different angle from the first angle. So it's like, what am I trying to say? And what's my angle? That refines your comedy. It makes, now you're really communicating and touching the audience because you're sharing an angle. It's like, uh, like Bill Burr with the joke he did about um, divorce settlements. You know, Tiger Woods wife getting $250, $250 million. She's getting a quarter of a billion dollars. She's a babysitter getting a quarter of a fucking billion dollars. We know what his angle is. This is ridiculous. These settlements. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? So he sometimes he just says it. These settlements are ridiculous. So that's his through line on that particular joke. That's his point of view. So does the emotion always need to be like a negative? No. No. Okay. I can delight my my <laughs> my nine year old daughter is like you see, we're driving, we're, you know, driving to school, right? And we, I like to play the radio. We like to listen to music, sometimes dance, sort of get warmed up for school. And uh, so we'll play the music. But then they go to the commercial. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they, they, they're, this erectile dysfunction commercial came on. And um, it's like, they can get pretty graphic. So I was like, my daughter doesn't need to listen to this. And two seconds later, my daughter's like, Dad, turn that back up. There might be some important information there for me. I have reptiles. Uh, <laughs> when that happened, I pulled over and I took an extra five minutes to write that joke down. <laughs> Even if she was late for school, the joke's <laughs> most important. And mm -hmm. it's like, when you're a comic, you like gets it. I've lost a couple of marriages because of being so into comedy. I remember one time I was with this woman for a while and she goes, Jerry, every night you seem to get up on stage and do comedy, but tonight you can't get it up for me. And I was like, hold on, I got to write that down. <laughs> Because the joke's more important than I just love how how nonchalant. I've lost a couple marriages for how much I love comedy. Like just not like that 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 happens, right, guys? And comedy <laughs> defines me, right? And, and if I can't be me, then I'm not going to be good for her, and, and she's not going to be good for me. And to oh, and to think, Joel gets in trouble for just doing a simple dab in front of his wife. My wife abhors when I do this. It's like, and she said it's because it makes me happy. So I think it's a good marriage. <laughs> Yeah. She's my, my wife recently said to me when and when we first met, she was like, oh, my parents, best friends are going to come see you at a comedy club because they hadn't her parents hadn't met me yet. Yeah. And they're like, um, it was before when we were just dating. She goes, my parents, best friends are going to come see you perform. It was at Harvey's in Portland. And she goes, um, I go, do you want me to change anything? And she was like, you better not. No. Now that we've been married 14 years, she's like, I don't like you making jokes about me anymore. <laughs> And it's like, so my wife doesn't like me to make jokes about her. So now I have a girlfriend. Nice. So, <laughs> so it could be either I have a girlfriend or yeah, these girlfriend jokes are really wife jokes. Hilarious. You know, nice. so. <laughs>
Oh, by, so question was from Mike yep, Marr. Mike Marr. Question. I am trying to write a joke from a grade school experience in the early 60s. How do I overcome references that millennials and ex-gens don't know? I like this because I've even made jokes about growing up in the 80s and 90s that people these days just goes right over their head. Without a doubt. That happens all the time. I did a, a fundraiser for a soccer team of 15-year-old, 16-year-old girls. And, um, you know, it was over at Flappers. They said, hey, Jerry, you, you can do this fundraiser and keep it clean. And I said, sure. It's a 15, 16-year-old soccer player, girls. And I was like, uh, they're not going to get some of these references. They're just not going to get them. So I did my jokes about soccer and uh, for those gals. And in this case, when you're talking about your childhood, it's about you, right? You're growing up mm -hmm. in sixth grade. And um, that happened like uh, um, several years ago when the millennials lose them. Then part of the joke part of the jokes on the way to the jokes is making fun of the reminding these millennials about these phrases or these things like uh you know it's back in the back in the day so we took the coke out and we and took the tab and threw it away that's back in the day when we had cokes with tabs and it's like you almost like like gilbert godfrey used to do this and he would basically take a moment to explain the joke mm -hmm. and that became the gag on the way to the big joke Right. So it'd be like, um, you know, so, so I, I remember uh, I remember this boy, Johnny Carson, Johnny Carson. He was a guy who had a talk show for about 30 years. Right. Like they should know this. Oh, you so know, especially almost... your comics. You're in the business. You're not doing your homework. You don't know Johnny Carson. So you're that's not... what Mike would like still make the reference, <clears throat> but then almost make a joke to the people that may not get the reference type. Deal. Yeah. Just Cop pulled me over and it's like, you know, he said, I, you know, I was like, he says, what do you got in a, got in the car? I said, I, I, you know, I got this battle Jack Daniels under the seat and reefer in the glove box. He arrested me immediately for referring to weed as reefer. Nah, <laughs> nah. Right. He nah, goes, that's old school. Get out the car. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good tip. So it's not like, don't edit your joke. Just actually find a new laugh based on making that reference. And this might help you find a character through line. I'm old school. Yeah. And then you do an exercise, top 10 reasons you know you're old school. And you, we know the top 10 sort of uh, because it was David Letterman's bag, right? And it was David Letterman's, the most famous segment in late night TV was the top 10 list. Yeah. Which is so interesting because it really, it was an exercise that writers used in writer's yeah. rooms for finding punchlines. Top 10 reasons you know your mother-in-law hates you. Top 10 reasons you know you're balding. Top 10 reasons... You know, you know, you're suffering from ED top 10 reasons, you know, you're a lazy lover. So now that helps you generate punchlines. So as you say these, you're taking the grabbing these punchlines. And then what you do is you hide the top 10 list and you take top three of those or top four of those and finesse them into a story. Now you have these punchlines to go about how come you're the why you're the old school guy, you know, because I'm old school and you can go on with this and then do it, use another punchline and write finesse the context around it and say because i'm old school mm. and it's like now you've got a whole character through line of your old school and then when people see you they can identify you with something like oh this dude he's um he's uh fuck i don't know his name but he's old school right and yeah. now you've already branded yourself that's what i'm like i'm currently like as as i've been i've been doing this 11 years now and i released a comedy special last year called the trophy husband and i was like this is the brand. And then in hindsight, I'm like, I don't know if I really want to lean into that. Also, because my wife doesn't like me. Well, we refer to my wife as Caramel here in the Hot Breath of her. So she doesn't nice hear me. Oh, yeah. But um, she doesn't really want me. I don't know. I, I'm leaving her out of it. So I'm looking for like, what is, how, how can I figure out like, how do I come off to people? What kind of funny, what kind of filter can I put my material through? And it's like, and I haven't figured it out yet. I'm thinking well, my... And over optimistic. Am I a almost grown up? Like I look 13, but I'm 33. Like I I'm the vice principal. Is it, but is that my, that's my whole act. I'm a vice principal. Like, no, it's like, no, 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 no. Almost like you're, that's, you're the kind of the, you're the, um, uh, you're the very helpful scholarly kind of vice principal guy. A great way to find this out is to you, you know, when you have your classes or when you're, when you're doing something online, ask somebody, ask them to write down in the chat, perceptively when you see me, what do you see? And that might help you find a through line too. Okay. It might help you find that, you know, yeah. when people started coming up to me and said, you remind me of George Carlin, you remind me of Jerry Seinfeld, you remind me of Johnny Carson. I kind of knew that first of all, I was driven, I started emulating Seinfeld when I was first started. 
mm -hmm. uh, till he made fun of me. And then um, I stopped doing that. But that was my way of finding, you know, that was, I hid behind that to sort of get up on stage. If I failed, I didn't fail. Jerry Seinfeld failed. He or made the fun character I was emulating kind of failed. It's almost like doing cover music, cover band music. Oh, that you were that deep into Seinfeld. You were just like basically emulating. When did he I make was fun emulating of his voice? Like I had my own jokes, but I'd emulate sort of his voice and his style and his observational qualities of nuance. And hey, you know, you know what? You know, I saw a sign that said positively no smoking. As a and a lot of people did back then. Like yeah. he was like he was almost like the template for a lot of yeah. comedians back then. Yeah, right. When did he make fun and of? And then when Carlin said take that catharsis, I was like, oh my god, what a release that was for me. So he made fun of you? Seinfeld did? Seinfeld, yeah. <laughs> where, where were you? Real we're at the, I was at the Laugh Factory. And I did, uh, I did, a sign, I did my, my material. But it was, and I got great laughs mm -hmm. uh, telling the story. And, uh, and I kind of used uh, kind of the Seinfeld technique to walk it all the way around and bring it back to a callback. And then um, they, you know, like, it made it them go, wow, that was very playful. And um, I got a, a, a really nice set. And then... Um, and I had followed one of the comedians I admired, but he bombed that night. I can't remember. He's no longer like on the circuit. You know, he's no longer touring. He's no longer doing anything. And it was like, and I really liked the dude. Uh, I can't remember his name. I'll look it up on the break. We're not, yeah. we don't have a break. See, that's the joke. <laughs> on the break. Uh, let's ask the band. Jerry thinks he's an AM radio still. <laughs> and it's like, um, but he, uh, he afterwards, I walk, I see Seinfeld standing right there at the bar and I go, hi, Jerry Seinfeld. He goes, whatever. Oh, cool. And I went, <laughs> Oh, and I'm a New Yorker. So I was like, dude, don't get personal. Yeah. You'll regret it. And I was like, New York attitude. I was like, don't get fucking personal. Right, You'll regret right, right. it. <laughs> why, 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 why are you talking to Seinfeld that way, dude? You know, and I, that's way back in the day in my early right. 20s. Yeah. Was, okay, was, cool. Yeah. So this has actually been an interesting topic throughout the series. And it is how does a comedian build a character or a persona? Well, that comes, you know, first of all, we get wrapped up in that, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the problems is if we get wrapped up in that, sometimes it could paralyze us when we're just starting to learn, learn how to write jokes, mm -hmm. right? So people say it takes 10 years to find a persona. I said, really? Ask Joel. He got up there after four and was like, hey, I found my brand. No, it's not, right? So it's like, we don't know yet. We're evolving. And when we our first like five to seven years is trying to learn how to write a joke. So that's why a lot of people get stuck on their persona my persona came kind of early with um most of us have a cynical approach to comedy because we're really we prove things wrong we like to take perceived statements of authority and prove them wrong right we like to look at something and go yeah well here's the mistake in that like if they say you know whatever happens in vegas stays in vegas and you're like what yeah unless it gets stuck in your crotch hair or tell that to your bank account or whatever it's like it doesn't always get stuck in Vegas. So we try to prove these things wrong, these perceived statements of authority. So it's like, so we all have a cynical approach. That's one level of our of our being. Um, you could be analytical. You could be um, ultra perceptive. You could be um, like, you know, even after Whitney was on, on this, getting popular, she hadn't really found her voice, which is now super independent woman. You know, I don't need this. I don't need a man. You know, and you feel that in her Roseanne. Roseanne, here's an exercise to find help you identify with your persona. Take some cliches and do cliche reformations. Now, cliches, cliches are are statements that everybody knows the ending to. You know, uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans. A penny saved is a penny earned. Uh, my mother used to say the best way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Right? We know those. So Roseanne had this cliche reformation that kind of defined her voice mm. and her attitude. It's like my mother said, the best way to a man's stomach is, <laughs> the best way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And she goes, I think the best way to a man's heart is straight through his chest. <laughs> that defined her. That joke made her famous. That branded her. She's like, I've done this. I'm not doing it anymore. I don't need a man. That was her sort of sassy fuck relationships attitude. And that kind of like blew up. That was like mm -hmm. her thing. And, and that joke, that cliche reformation joke that she did, as simple as it may seem, and most great jokes are very simple. We think we're supposed to be complex and interesting and it's like and clev super clever, but that's when we lose the audience. If we're just like simple, like 
Jeselnik is like simple reverses. But mm. he, then he adds sort of like, how can I edge this up a bit or add a little extra mischief and darkness? Because because he realized that's the one, those are the ones the audience was really laughing at, you know? Um, and But they're like almost simple reverses all the time. He has the setup and all of a sudden it's like, what are they expecting? I'm going to go the opposite way. And then, um, you know, Brian Kiley, a masterful joke writer too, who is like the head monologue writer for Conan O'Brien, mm. he's so good at that as well. Um, but, um, and that kind of, his voice is a little, um, he's like, always, the jokes are always on him. He's like, I'm just trying to, he shrugs a lot. I'm just trying to, just trying to get from point A to point B and um, gotcha. stuff keeps happening. You know, and that's his thing. The thing is, is his emotional spectrum is about this vast. And so I said, he'll never be famous, famous, even though his jokes are amazing because it's generic where Stephen Wright didn't have a real vast emotional spectrum, but his comedy was so thoughtful, so thinking it really got our brains involved and we were trying to solve the puzzle with him, you know? So that's what attracted us there. And his nuance of being you know, almost like, Oh, my brain is so tired. I can't even, you know, and he'd be like, uh, I spilled spot remover on my dog. Now it's gone. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, you made a, a few good points there first off some people are like what's my persona and it's like well first figure out how to write a joke like figure out how to write jokes first and then like let your persona come organically through your ability to write jokes that are personal and then also asking people perceptively what do you think of when you see me and then maybe have cliches and then reform them in your own personal style and just see what comes out of that yeah, so the cliche reformation starts to help you identify a point of view. And then once you start to go, oh, this is how I think? Oh, okay. So you can start to build on that. Now, like. don't be so eager to chase this guy, this persona. Sometimes it's fun to just experiment with the persona and make a discovery. Um, and sometimes, like, like, look at Jim Gaffigan. He's got that little sort of voice of consciousness that happens all the time. Yeah. I used to do that because I used to worry about the older women or the women in the audience worried about that I was uh, doing uh, something uh, sexual or something dirty or naughty. And especially if I was doing an older crowd and, and be like, she, the woman, I always felt like the, the older women, women might have been judging me. So I'd be like, every time I do a joke, that might he's always referencing something about his dick. You know, mm -hmm. and I beat them to the punch. And then I heard Gavigan. I go, Gavigan kind of does that. So I'm going to leave that alone yeah. and then find a different voice. And I had this uh, voice I used to do was a bit of a stoner voice based on this guy I knew in high school named Brian Stark. And be like, whoa, no way, dude. <laughs> Check that out. And he became a whole separate character um, by himself. And I wound up opening for me as this character. And then I take off the wig. And it was like a stoner dude. Nobody knew that it was me. <laughs> and I'd get up and do this character for 30 minutes. Then the MC would come up for three minutes. I'd change into a blazer, black shirt, and come back up uh, you know, with a bald head and go, hey, how about a hand for Charlie Stone, ladies and gentlemen? Isn't he funny? Is. And they'd be like, "Every I might get a standing ovation. And they'd be like, where's Charlie Stone? We want to hang out with Charlie Stone. I go, fuck Charlie Stone. <laughs> That's your Tony Clifton, huh? Right? Yes, that was my Tony Clifton. And it was so fun to do that, but exhausting at the same time. But I realized they loved the, the refined character that Charlie Stone brought. And he had a unique point of view, man. Everything was like, you know, it's like, uh, I remember I, I took... I was in philosophy <laughs> and this, yeah. I, I took my midterm and I brought it to the instructor and he was like, um, Jerry, <laughs> cause that's my name. <laughs> He'd be like, Jerry, you know, you forgot to turn in your final paper. <laughs> so I'm going to give you IB. I said, well, this is philosophy, critical thought, right? <laughs> He's like, that's right. I go, I did that paper in my mind. <laughs> he gave, you know what I got? <laughs> B minus. <laughs> So it's like, and people were laughing at now the character delivery. The joke is not on the page. You might look at it and go, what? But the character delivering the joke is what made that joke come alive. So yeah. sometimes the character point of view is so important to make that joke work. I think I just, I just get impatient, Jerry. Like I'm 11 years in. I'm like, I, I keep, 
And these are things I tell people too. Only worry about what you can control. And then I still, I hit moments where I'm like, why not me? Where's my fame? Like, and I love, and I, I, I'm so grateful for where my career is at and that the hop breath exists. And I wouldn't want any other way, but I think I still, as a comedian working, aspiring, still have to fight those of like, okay, well, what's my character? How can I brand myself? What is my sitcom? Like, I still have to like battle these, especially now that I released a special and I'm like, okay, what's chapter two of my career? But it's not like what you're saying also is just a lot of repetition, trial and error, paying attention to what people respond to and start to build it over time. It's not like a light bulb. And sometimes it's something else that somebody else sees, right? That you can't see because you're just too close. Yeah. So that's why you ask people, what do you see when you see me? And be yeah. honest, like, or sometimes you have to write down, write down your top 10 most critical flaws. Mm. I try to please too much. Mm. I'm always trying to please too much. And it's like, I try to like, I'm the peacemaker at my, in my house, or I'm, you know, um, if I need to complain, if, you know, you're the opposite of a Karen, a Karen would have no problem going, I need to talk to the manager. You'd be like, yeah, honey, let's just let it go. Let's right. Uh, You're like a beta male. Not make waves. <laughs> you know, yeah. so that could be a part of maybe who you are. And it's like once you start to find that, it's like I know um, I'm pretty confident with who I am, right? And so, so now I can explore other characters too. And maybe in the exploration of other characters, I find another little nuance I can add to my main character. George Burns went through eight, you know, eight basically iterations of who George Burns is before he found George Burns. Oh, okay. So it's like, it's like sometimes you'll evolve, and then at some point you all of a sudden just clicks. Usually it's about twelve years in, so you got about twenty-four months, Joel. Cool. And all of a sudden okay. you're gonna go, I'm Superman. I didn't know this. <laughs> See, that, that's, that's kind of an interesting thing because, like, one other person we've talked to actually said the same thing you did. Like, talk to people and like, who do I look like? And so actually, I put that to the test, which and talking to seven different strangers five of them said you look like a dj like you look like you belong in radio i don't know if that's just because i'm ugly but you know it's like you look like a radio guy basically Actually, one they person say you said, got a face for radio <laughs> face yeah. for radio yeah, one yeah. person <laughs> said you look like the sun like you could be related to wolfman jack so it was like dj Ooh, dj i'm like so how do i put that onto a stage like that so that's my next big thing is like okay how do i how do you put that into stand-up was like yeah, Other what than, are the traits of us DJ? Like right. lazy, are you stoner, pushover, like aiming for the middle? Like jo like Johnny Fever from WKRP. So, you know. I think also one way to find uh, what I tell uh, students sometimes is like, who are your favorite comics? Mm -hmm. Those people resonate you with you for a reason because there's a part of you in them or there's a part of them in you. I was like, they think the way you do, or they have the same sort of reactions to things that you do. And it's like, um, some, like look at John Mulaney. John Mulaney is just John Mulaney. Yeah. You know, he brings all his idiosyncrasies up there and he talks about his drug addiction and his rehab and then winds up checking into rehab shortly after that. Yeah, <laughs> that that's right. That's cool. And he's still flawed and he still goes through his, like he's going through his journey and failures and, uh, successes and he's up there talking about him on stage that's quite funny because my favorite is actually like all-time favorite is actually craig ferguson like Oof. and yeah, i just realized right. i just realized like a few months ago that he actually had a completely different character at one point oh bing mm -hmm. hitler bing hitler yeah wow yeah. which was like amazing um so yeah so we have a few more questions yeah, um, let's, sandy let's, let's asks do rapid fire here and yeah the plane how do you here. react to uh your joke without seeming um contrived or announcing to your audience here is a joke that's a great question because yeah. um and one, one of the things that drove me crazy on on uh tonight show is like jay leno would often go oh here's another one Be like stop telling people it's a fucking joke man you take the surprise out of it. We know you're, he goes, well, you know, everybody knows this is what we do with the monologue. Yeah. Well, yeah, but Johnny Carson used to get up there on that stage, hit that star and go, I read this uh, story uh, in the newspaper in, uh, out of Minnesota. And all of a sudden you're in the story with him. And then he has a punchline at the end when it's a story and we think it's a story. And all of a sudden you hit a punchline, despite the fact that we know that you're on that star in that instant, we're not thinking about that. We're in the story with you. We don't take a moment to go, oh, yeah, this is monologue, so this will probably be a joke. 
because we don't have the capability to multitask. We think we do, but we don't. And I know, I know that because my wife was like, hey, when you're down on me, play with my nipples. I go, oh, now you think I can multitask? No. But, um, sorry, did I throw in a dirty one there? His See, wife was that? He's so dirty. How does he do that? <laughs> right? So what I do sometimes is I try to make sure it's a conversation. Oh, shit. I forgot to tell you guys. Um, sometimes that little trick coaxes me to get in the real moment. And so back when I started, I would do something like that. Oh shit, I forgot to tell you guys. I was on the drive in here and then I got out of the car. Just, you had to walk that block. You know, the block's like, hey, could you get a parking lot? It's like three blocks here. And now it's like, I'm in a conversation. It's the moments are happening right here. And I'll so, be like, um, and this guy's, and the, the car rolls by playing this old school rap. Anybody remember the song? It was like, don't want no short dick, man. And it's got playing at like, you know, 80 decibels. So the whole world can hear it. You know, how embarrassing is that? Don't want no short dick men. They actually use those words. Don't want no short dick men. How embarrassing is that for me? You know, I'm Native American. We carried our spears. It didn't come as part of the package. You know, some, some comics telegraph it at the end, though. They'll, like, say the punchline and almost have, like, a ta-da. There it is. You know what I mean? Well, like, I think they must have taken Judy Carter's little... course. Say what? They took Judy Carter's course. Because I remember I took, I try to go to everybody's course to say, hey, man, maybe there's a light bulb switch that comes on. And Judy said this to a class one time. She was like, you know, sometimes I'll tell a joke and, you know, I'll try to let the audience know that that's the punchline. I'll go. So that could become a habit. And I'll be like, comics. you yeah. do ta-da? No, yeah. don't do ta-da. That's magic. Don't do ta-da. How do you, you iron it out? Ta-da, that means your punchline isn't strong enough. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's, and that, I think that's something Sandy was asking for like her own personal sets is like, sometimes she will like telegraph, like say it and kind of, is it just being aware of it and then being like, okay, this set, I'm going to work on not doing that. You hit the nail on the head being aware of it. It's not only being aware of it. It's also being aware of what am I using to try to get the laugh here? Mm. Like at the end, like one, one of this, one of the guys that came to me from you, he said, here's a, here's the last joke I want to share with you. And, um, He's like, um, and I, and I'm not sure why it's funny, and maybe it isn't. But uh, and it was very funny. I said, oh, it's it's incongruity. You're doing an associative joke between these two ideas here, and I said, and you just fell upon. It, but now you know it. Now I would take that joke and then make it a template, and that joke is now a template for other future jokes that are falling into this care ca category. Oh, cool. So if I know if I have two dissimilar ideas converging, I'm going to take. I'll be able to play those two dissimilar ideas. Right. So it's like um, there's that uh, the exercise is like when you said one word rain. And I remember Mitt came to me with that. He said, I, I'm struggling with this one word on the right 10. And I said, oh, rain. So what else can rain be? Right. Rain can be. So that's one word. It's really hard. Rain precipitation. What is the definition of rain? What if rain was opposite of what we're thinking of it is rain could also be the name of a stripper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. So oh, it's like, you know, day. it was like, you know, sometimes she let me snort coke off her ass. Then we knew it was rain with a chance of snow. Huh? <laughs> right. And all of a sudden, because that asked the questions, ask the questions, ask the questions. Yeah. Remember, the setup is not to be necessarily be funny. It's just to convey information. So the moment you convey information. And then you're taking that information and then spinning it in a different way from what they're perceiving you're saying then that's the, the joke comes from the information and it, we're leading him somewhere, you know, trying to teach my daughter how to tie her shoes, which is weird because she's 22. And she's like, um, dad, I can't, dad, I can't. I said, how many times have I told you not to use that word? I am not your dad. No, uh, yeah. Now I know I'm using ambivalence for that final punch, right? It's like, you don't want to say that to a kid. That could fuck him up. She's in jail. But um, when you're saying, I know I'm using ambivalence, so I'm going to deliver it a certain way. It's the same sort of technique as, you know, you say, uh, my son who is in Jersey just came out of the closet as gay. Oh, Esther, your son lives in Jersey? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to be excited about the, or worried about, is what are you going to do? He's gay? What are you going to do? But that's the one we're focused on. Instead, we go to the Jersey thing. My dad, who lives in Bakersfield, was just diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. I know it's horrible, right? He lives in Bakersfield. Who wants to do, be there? So it's almost like believe, Sandy should just believe in her joke more and being aware of it and also believing it's funny without that little extra hitch. And it'll start to kind of work its way out. Yeah, deliver it as a conversation. And if you know what you're doing, 
you know, you can have fun with that. So if you have it as you just make it a conversation, just like re get in touch with that energy that you have when you're at a party mm -hmm. and you're having a conversation and then try to work your jokes that way. That's one, that's one way to do it. I like to take that joke and then talk about it. Like it's like, you know, like, like right off the top of my head, it's rehearsed spontaneity as David Letterman used to call it rehearsed oh, yeah. spontaneity. Yeah. Cause I remember going to a, a Letterman rehearsal and then staying for the taping Letterman rehearsal. He was like, Oh, and uh, Paul, I almost forgot to um, make sure we, and then you get to that segment in the taping and he's like, Oh, and uh, Paul, um, I go, that's planned. Yeah. <laughs> like I was fooled. Right. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, yeah, go ahead, buddy. Yeah. Bobby asks, what does surprise represent in the teaser method? Is it the left turn? Could be the left turn. A left turn is, would be a reverse. Right. Like when I said, um, trying to teach my daughter how to tie her shoes or that simple one. I have a nine year old. I have a nine year old girl. And we're thinking, oh, he said he said I have a nine year old daughter. No, I didn't say that. I said I have a nine year old girl. Right. But they're implying or they're assuming I'm nine year old daughter. So if I say I have a nine year old girl in my basement, that could be the left turn. Right. So it's a reverse. That's a very specific technique. Right. You lead them to a very explicit assumption. Uh, or the one was like, you know, I woke up at the hotel room, uh, the Silver Legacy, uh, my first night working there, and the housekeeper is seven in the morning, banging on the door, just banging. Finally had to get up and let her out. She was relentless, right? We have an expectation that's created, and we mm -hmm. shattered that expectation. So that's a reverse. That's that left turn. Not all jokes have a left turn. You don't need a left turn on every one of your jokes. If I do an incongruity joke, like when these guys on this podcast called me and they tried to like, oh, you say you can take any logical grouping of words and make it funny. I didn't say it. I said, you should believe that because there are logical groupings of words on my computer. I haven't succeeded with it yet. But if I, I tell that to students so they don't run away from a straight line because it's not already funny. But if you have, so they go, we're going to give you a random joke and see if you can do something with this. It's like sort of like the right 10 club, but they're trying to make me look like an idiot mm -hmm. and uh, rather than help me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I could sense their attitude. I go, hey, let's try it. Let's see if it could work, man. I might fail miserably right here on, on your well listened to podcast. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so they were like, now we're just random thing. We just got this out of the page, right out of the internet. It said a new study uh, uh, it said that um, a Lego has become a more popular, has, over, has beat Ferrari as the world's most popular brand. Lego has beat Ferrari as the world's most popular brand, the first thing I'm thinking is like attitude. That's ridiculous. Lego over Ferrari. And then I do a quick listing technique, Ferrari, red, uh, convertible, hot model. Right. And that's what came into my head. That's that's part of the list that when I was thinking about Ferrari. And so I goes like I, new study. Now we're making fun of the study and we're calling the study ridiculous. That's the angle. So I go Lego has replaced Ferrari as the world's most popular brand. Really, Lego replace Ferrari? It's like, yeah, yeah. Try, try fucking a supermodel after showing her your Legos. Ah, uh, <laughs> right? so the attitude gets to the joke. Surprise! Yeah. And the joke is now I'm playing the emotional through line through the end of the joke, which is another trick to it. For that to answer that question, play the play the emotion through the joke. Don't play the gag. Mm. So uh, Mario asked, "Can you give an example of a configurational trigger?" Yeah, Mitch Hedberg, Stephen Wright. Um, uh, Mitch Hedberg, I'm staying at a hotel. I can't tell you the name, but it has two trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And people go, double tree. Ha, <laughs> ha, yeah, I got it. We love to be able to solve the puzzle, right? It's like, uh, you know, uh, be like uh, Stephen Wright would be like, you know, there's this light switch in my house. It doesn't do anything. Every time I walk past it, I flick it on, I flick it off. I flick it on, I flick it off. About six months later, I got a letter from a lady in Germany saying, cut it out. <laughs> oh, I get it. You know, it's like we hear that moment. Or sometimes don't finish the ending, right? I have a student. Um, he was when he first came to me, he was overweight, had social anxiety. So his therapist said, take a comedy class. And he did. And great guy. And you know, he was like so had such anxiety, he would shine when he would took the stage because he was already sweating, you know, had that, that anxiety sweat going on. And he had a joke. He says, I live uh, he says, and we told him to just be. Just tell the truth about you. What? Just tell the truth. And he was like, I, I'm gay. I live in West Hollywood. And he's like, it's really hard to date in West Hollywood because all the guys are tan and chiseled. And I'm, well, like I said, I'm, uh, it's hard to date in West Hollywood. 
he doesn't explain what he is. We see what he is. Yeah. So the audience laughs at the fact oh that he didn't even have to explain it. It's their their involvement in the configuration of it makes them laugh harder because they're like, yeah, we got it. Now, if they have to configure too much, mm -hmm. if there's more than like two seconds, it diminishes the laugh and will sometimes diminish the laugh to zero. So it ha they have to be able to figure it out pretty quickly, a second and a half, you know, or something like that. Cool. Yeah, Bo, we got any more? Um, somebody asked, where is it at? Davida asked, uh, oh, she stated you have to have thick skin to be a comedian, but at what age would you encourage a child who has stand-up potential? This and is actually interesting because today my principal said, we have a lot of students who love writing jokes. Maybe you can teach them how to structure it. And I just, it's perfect timing, Bo, as well, because I just did a 12-year-old's podcast today, not to brag. It's called The Chatting Comedian. And um, he asked me to be on his show. And so he's been doing a podcast, an interview, comedy interview podcast, and he's 12. It's very cool. Awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. Well, 12 is a good is a good range, right? So that's when we start to make fun of our friends and you know, we get we're able to take the insults, sort of the ranks. We get ranked out by our friends and we're cool with that because we know it's fun and games. Eight, nine, and ten, they're still crying because they called me, you know, they called me uh, a klutz. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And now when you get like when you get to 12, you're able to you get it now. And also keep in mind, <clears throat> I've I've coached. I had a, a student of mine. She had 11 kids. Right. So um, uh, m many of them surrogates. But she brought the kids to, to do a comedy class over the summer. Oh. And so we'd meet one day a week for about five weeks. And then we're putting on a talent show at her house. And she's uh, married to a multi multimillionaire. So that was their thing. And I thought, oh, cutest thing ever. She would work with them, then I would work with them, and we they wound up putting on a really good talent show. And I was helping them take their kind of nuanced ideas and their nuanced jokes based on what are their quirks, individual quirks about them, and may, may turn them into jokes. So they whether they knew it was funny or not was a different story, but they knew they were getting a laugh. Um, so that's like, remember we used to watch Looney Tunes, Bugs Bunny. Some of those jokes when we were kids didn't make any sense. My parents were laughing, but I'd be like, huh? How's that funny? Right? Well, they don't understand irony at that at that age, eight, you know, that young age. 12, you begin to get it, you begin to see it. When you're 15, 16, you start developing the, the, the ability for complex thought and critical thinking. When you're 24, you don't even, you barely have a fully developed frontal cortex. So, so in those age, that 12 year old is is really good age to start. You know, and then 14, you'll start really hitting a good stride. It's like when Chappelle started at like 14, Eddie Murphy yeah. started at like 14, but Eddie Murphy started at 14 because he was basically reciting Richard Pryor's and I think Bill Cosby's routines. Mm -hmm. And then finally at 19, when everybody goes, oh my God, he's amazing. Other comments are going, okay, you got to stop doing Richard Pryor's routine. He's like, why? He said, because that's his material. He didn't even know. He was like, I didn't know that. I thought it was everybody's material. Yeah, so how would you teach, and how would Bo, and I'd imagine, you know, I'd be happy to help Bo with this too, but yeah. like, it's not like you're you're going to take them through the, f like, f nine comedy triggers or things. Like, how do you really kind of boil it down to teach kids the the essentials? Well, it's not about, uh, what I would do is say it's not about being funny. It's about telling, you know, just, you know, making observations, honest observations, starting with honest observations mm. and, and basic facts about you. My mother always says, um, I'm going to kick him where the sun don't shine. It's like, uh, so what does she mean by that? Oh, you're going to kick him in the butt, right? Right, okay. That's what we know, right? That's, we mm -hmm. know that phrase. It means I'm going to kick him where the sun doesn't shine. I'm going to kick him in the butt. So where else doesn't the sun shine? Seattle, oh, yeah. right, in the closet, you know? Yeah. It's like, um, it's like I'm, so my mother always says, I'm going to kick him where the sun don't shine. I'm be like, I was like, you're going to kick him in Seattle? So simple truth jokes are great for kids. Simple truth. Um, Study the riddles. Learning riddle writing is actually learning to write jokes backwards. Hmm. You're coming up with the punchline first. Write 10. That's right. The punch word of the punchline. Mm -hmm. That's right 10. Yeah. And then writing the joke, finding the joke behind it. So sometimes those um, um, what we call uh, collocations. We, that, that's groupings of words we see together a, a lot. You know, it's like uh, uh, carefully selected. You know, we only use carefully selected prime beef. As opposed to, you know, 
not carefully selected as opposed to like frivolously selected. Mm. And we don't, we don't use prime beef. We use roadkill, you know, <laughs> like, we don't, it's like carefully. So we always have, so if you look up collocations, there's a lot of those combination phrases that don't belong together. We don't need that. You know, and it's like, uh, we're going to use all available assets to find this missing person and some, uh, some unavailable assets, you know, or whatever. It's like the phrasing with those implications and the, the assumption of what those words mean are so strong, we just default. Okay, yeah, that sounds right. Instead of really looking at it and go, wait a second, all available assets? When I was 12 years old, this is why I thought 12 was a good age, Bo. When I was 12 years old, I went to the, uh, went to the post office with my dad, and this is in New York, and on the right above the handle of the post office door, it said, no dogs allowed except seeing eye dogs. And I said, dad, What's a seeing eye dog? And he said, that's a dog that helps blind people to get around. And uh, I said, that doesn't make sense. Is a dog going to read this sign? <laughs> and I go, well, who's, the, who's the sign for then? <laughs> and then then uh, uh, Gary Shandling did the joke like in like 1976 or something like that. I was like, hey, wait a second. My that's dad was cool. like, you did that joke when you were 12. I go, what? I said, oh, I remember that. That sign. It never forget that sign. And I was like, oh, neat. So I did a joke. I didn't know I did a joke. I was just asking a question, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Awesome. That, that, that's great. Because actually, like, with where I, the school I work at, we have a news broadcast every single day, and there's a joke segment. And so a lot of students are sending in jokes and trying to learn how to write them. And so now my new principal's like, hey, here's a good idea. I, I want you to actually mentor these kids because they may have potential one day and may want to choose it. And Looking at the conversation we had is like, hey, I never knew at you know 18 that, hey, I love comedy, but I didn't know how to get there, never thought about it. So that's very helpful, yeah. I think one of the best things to start with would be wordplay, double entendre, okay. right? Like we often misunderstand the meaning of a word. Um, and, uh, I'm, uh, and then um, simple truth jokes. Now, simple truth jokes is like you hear a lot of times in – in lyrics or in uh, sonnets or in um, scripture, very symbolic words, right? Very poetic words. And they're implied, they're, they're used to imply something, but they're not explicitly, the words, if it, the explicit meaning of a word could be totally different. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, you ever listen to the, it's a small world song. It's a world of joy. It's a world of tears. It's a world of hope. It's a world of fears. Joy, hope, tears, fears. Isn't this a song about being bipolar? <laughs> <laughs> so it's the simple truth of it. It's like you listen to listen to like uh, Spring Springsteen, Bruce Springsteen. Hey, little girl, is your daddy home? Did he go and leave you all alone? I got a bad desire. Whoa, whoa, whoa pedo fire. Really? <laughs> uh, so what point did Springsteen become a pedophile? That's what I want to know. Oh, like, we just... never really think about what the words mean. We're just buying the concept that's being that's being shared with us in a poetic way or whatever. So those two little tricks work well with kids. Like the double entendre, and double entendre is like a main go-to in sitcom and in commercial writing. Mm. It's like, especially with kids that are still on that precipice of 10 to 12, they still love those little fun jokes. And it's like, um, like uh, uh, if you go, like, look at the commercial for Discover, the credit card, right? The guy's like they have, holding a frog in his hand. He's on the phone. Discover, yes, you guys have frog insurance, right? Yes, we have fraud insurance. And there's a split screen. And they're doing the play on fraud and frog. Now, if you were to do that at a comedy club, as an adult, people would go, hack, right? Which I hate. There's nothing that's hacked. It's just, it's, it's like, it's just been overdone. But if you can find a new punchline to a, com or to, a, to a premise that's been done a bazillion times, that's genius, right? And it, like something we've never heard before, wow, right? That's, so never, hack kills creativity. So does the word no. So it's like, they're like frog, fraud, fraud, frog. And it's like, we're on the same page. Yeah, totally on the same page at Discover. <laughs> <laughs> commercial one a Clio. And there's a student I teach, and I was telling him about this, and he was like, Jerry, I wrote that commercial. Wow. I was like, what? 
Dave, you wrote wow. that commercial? Yeah, you know I've been in advertising, right? You never shared that with me at all. Wow. I'm just helping you with your stand-up. He goes, yeah, here's my here's my page. And I go to his page and look at all these commercials. I go, you did this one too? He goes, uh, he goes yeah, but I love it. It's like that wordplay on the Discovery. He goes, I learned that in your two-day workshop. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Like, had Charlie so cool. Barron's on here. I had Char after we did our, our second interview with you, you told us about Charlie, and I ended up having Charlie on the podcast too. He's great. Yeah, Charlie's great. Great yeah. guy. Yeah, I, guy. He figured yeah. it out. Yeah. And so happy um, for his uh for his success. I mean, what he said, we were like in class. He said, How do you break through? I said, do a YouTube video, have a channel, have a specific character and a, a character niche, and just uh you can start with delivering the news for a minute and a half or three never a minute, make it go with the three minutes when you start. And I don't know whether he remembered that or whether it sunk went to the back of his head and he's, he's going through he started when i found out when i found out he had a youtube channel he already had 77,000 subscribers and then they found out he booked a show at flappers in the main room on a saturday at four o'clock and sold it out yeah and i bought tickets was... and i got you know i bought tickets before it, it sold out of course i you know because i told him i tech I, I emailed him and said hey man i'm coming to see your show he goes hey i'll get you in i said no you're worth buying the tickets for dude believe that start believing that now right yeah. so i'm happy to buy a ticket for you that's fucking great i'm so excited right so i go there sold it out at four o'clock in the afternoon who does that charlie barons who established wow. this huge fan base and yep. only seventy-seven thousand subscribers at the time now he has like three hundred and fifty thousand or more yeah right? so he's going to be booking tours selling out rooms based on that subscriber base because man i saw the show the jokes aren't incredible but they're good because the character character yeah and this and the people that come to see him are his fans man and they buy everything you know yeah. you can he could sell his merch that way he can scale his his appearances and plus he gives them value too because like, hey i got this thing signed by charlie barons he's our guy man it's a walk minute yeah you know? and you you have fans uh you have fans in here uh jerry joel brills um says hello oz morris sent me oz, a message joel, yeah great guys yeah, Oz Oz Morris told me to let you know hello as well while you were on here. Oz is a uh, yeah, Oz is terrific, man. So, and um, Oz was in my late night class, in my late night writing class. You oh, know. very he's cool. Like, yeah, he's, yeah he's, he was like, boy, he picked up on the nuances. You could tell he was practicing because every week he came back and his material got sharper and tighter. And he was like, some of those jokes would have rivaled some guys' jokes that I worked with. You know, you know what you're like. Oh, that's a great joke, dude. Yeah, he's in the right pin club like every day. Yeah, he's in there. He's in there steady. Uh, Bo, what do you think? Maybe one more question. Uh, do you, I saw I saw a good one from Ben Webb about teaching comedy. Uh, you let me see that one. It. Ben Webb. Uh, all right. I was like, I was skeptical about that one, but okay. Yeah, sure. All right. Question on a scale of one to Greg Dean, how much do you love teaching comedy? <laughs> how much do I love teaching comedy? I guess, yeah. I guess I'll oh, scale oh, one to Greg I'm Dean. I'm like one, one to, to Greg, Greg Dean, Dean, which is the higher. What's the it's yeah. like I I I I tell you what, I I fell in love with it by accident because I didn't know I was already doing it and I was just helping guys. You know, when I was do I used to go to open mics, listen to guys work, and I'd write down tags and toppers for them and just hand them to them. I said, hey, if you if you find that funny, hey, feel free to use it. And they're like, wow, I can use that? And so that's what I was doing. And then when I started, it's like, since some of my students really helped me teach because they'd be like, how did you get there? How What were the steps do you use to get there? And it made me have to think of what I was using rather than just intuitiveness or my instinct over the years. I had really had to come up with what was my mental process. And by working harder, it made me a little bit of a better teacher because now I couldn't, I didn't just have to punch up somebody's joke. I can show them how to get there so that now they can do it, you know, teach somebody to fish, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so one of great, Greg Dean, I fucking love it. Uh, and again, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, disparage Greg or any other teacher that's trying to teach people. Greg's been doing it for 40 years. So, yeah. um, you know, I'm a fan of his, even though he tried to sue me. Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, when I first started to teach comedy, I was like, um, you know, uh, comedy is basically the one definition of a joke. The original definition of a joke are two dissimilar ideas converging. And that was on my youth, that first YouTube video uh, I did about Tiger Woods. It was my mm -hmm. first video that I ever put out there. And he says, I'm going to sue you. I go, for what? He goes, juxtaposition of two contrasting ideas is mine. I go, you know who really originally came up with that, Greg? Aristotle. 
So unless you're two thousand and one year old, then uh, you know he came up with a first. Then a man named James Beatty, a Scottish philosopher in fourteen seventy three, recoined the phrase, uh, recoined the definition. So it's like uh, I said. Besides, it's a concept. You can't patent a concept, Greg. You know, it's like otherwise, um, um, the uh, everybody would be paying Ford uh, for the internal combustion engine. You know, uh, so it's like because they invented it. So it's yeah. like, and it's like you, I didn't. You gonna sue me for what? He goes, I didn't teach you comedy, so you could teach it. And I go, I think the pills they have you on are really hurting your 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 thought process, Greg. It, we're not in competition, brother. Amen. We should oh, synergize. It would make it so much better. Because you know what? There was a student of mine who went to him and something he said made her get the reverse that she wasn't getting when I was saying it. Is that something against me? No, it's a fucking win, man. Oh, I'm so yeah. happy. And she started writing good reverses. Whatever he said worked. Great. Then by all means, you don't become a doctor by going to one teacher. And people say, oh, you can't teach comedy. You either got it or you don't. Really? What babies are popping out of the womb going, hey, is this thing on? Yeah. <laughs> you call that a birth canal? You know, they're not doing yeah. it. They, you learn through exposure and experience. And if you can consolidate that exposure experience and give people actual tools and reasons people laugh, they don't laugh randomly, man. They laugh for a reason. Now, if you can identify that reason, you know, you can start writing jokes. Like right. Chappelle knows that he when he does that, he goes, I'm going to tell you the punchline. And then I'm going to do the joke and you're still going to laugh. Yep. Yeah. And what he did basically kind of the same thing is like riddle writing. He basically told us the punchline, then tells the story, and then that becomes a callback now. So good. And it's yeah. like coincidentally, it fit in a totally different story in a different situation. That same phrase kicked her in the cunt. <laughs> hey, it's, it's incredible. Well, yeah. Are twelve year olds listening? We're in trouble. We're like, that was that was on the hey, man, play us off at this point. Right. Yes. We're not. Well, let's not cancel Corley on this. We start a hashtag cancel yeah. Corley. Did you hear him on hot breath? Yeah. So he and oh, what he did was here's what's great about Chappelle. Chappelle knew that he had to really make this woman a big antagonist for him to get away with that phrase or that mm -hmm. action that he said that happened. Mm -hmm. Right. And he made her a really bad person, a really bad antagonist. So then when he did that, it worked. You know, you can't attack a woman without there being a reason, right? So if like that's what if I'm doing jokes about my ex, I always say my ex who cheated on me. Yeah. You know, my ex who cheated on me called me on Halloween, said, Jerry, I don't know what to pretend to be for Halloween. I said, Well, why don't you just dress normally and pretend you're in a committed relationship? <laughs> <laughs> so now the audience feels oh, we need to and they're not when you set up the antagonist, they're rooting for you to win. Right. But the tack has to be proportional, you know. Uh, Sullivan, the same comic who earlier said lazy childbirth, uh, she said, I found you through Steve Martin's master class, and then I found Father Joel. So we're, there's, a, there's a funnel to both of us here, Jerry. Oh, listen, hear that. Steve Martin's master class refers people to my 13 comedy structures. My students, I said, yeah. You, hey, Jerry, you heard that Steve Martin has a master class out? Should I get it? Fuck yeah, he's a legend. Yeah. Right, he's yeah. a living legend. I would absolutely get that course. Then they were coming back, Jerry. I got the course, like you said. He refers people to your thirteen comedy structures, so I got a refund. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get a refund. You're hearing Steve Martin talk about yeah. comedy. It's worth the ninety nine bucks, idiots. Come on. Come on. I mean, I've, I've listened to some of it. It's really good. It really yeah. is. Gives That's you Steve insights Martin. and viewpoints, and and they're like the structures are just one one element of it. You know, that's, but it's like now, it, but it gives you a tool. Oh, I can write a reverse today. I can write incongruities today. I can write some, uh, uh, some observational stuff today. I can uh, write a paradox. I can write irony. It doesn't have to have that left turn. It just has to have irony. Oh my God, what a coincidence. What, a, you know, that's true. So it's like, that's where that joke comes from is like, is from the irony. Oh, I didn't know that, you know, irony. And uh, let's say paradox is awesome. Like when Jerry Seinfeld says, he says this on Talk Funny on that, that HBO uh, you know, roundtable. He said, you know, you need to go deeper with your jokes, right? Joe said that. You need to go deeper with your jokes. But then you look at everybody st starts thinking deep. I got to be deep. Got to be deep. It's like um, sometimes just the paradox or the irony is what makes it deep. So it's like Jerry Seinfeld's subject matter is not deep. 
CK's subject matter is not deep or original. He's talking about the same shit we're all living, you know, marriage, kids, the struggles we all go through. His approach, his unique points of view, is the way he sees it is what makes it deep. The paradox or the, like Seinfeld does that joke, we refer to distance and time. We'll be like, how far is it to the store? About 15 minutes. Doesn't work the other way around at all. What time do you get off work? About five miles. Mm. That's not deep. It's just a paradox. I go, oh, shit, I never thought about it that way. That's so true. So it's like that's where like sometimes deeper can create creative paralysis because we're trying to be too original. You know, it's like instead mm -hmm. of just going, all right, let me see if I can put this joke in the form of a paradox. And then that makes the brain do a little dance between the both hemispheres there. And we go, oh, that works. Study paradox. Paradox will, you know, it's just simple things like, you know, why do they call it a boxing ring when it's square? Mm -hmm. You know, it's they, they come from ponderables. If you like read 10 or 20 ponderables that you download from the Internet and you're not in a funny mood, you're going to be in a funny mood after that. You're going to be in a creative ponderable mood. Right. You know, if you drove your car at the speed of sound, could you hear your stereo? Yes, just the front speakers, but not the back. You know, people go, oh, and that's that's deep to them. Oh, that's deep. <laughs> well, let's let's land this plane here. Um, yeah. I mean, Sullivan it, said she read the book like the Bible. I don't know if that means she read it, then went and did other something else, like send. Yeah, exactly. She or read she it, beat somebody else over the head with it. it. Yeah. You know, she uh, read the book and then said, We got to keep those illegal immigrants out of our country. Yeah. <laughs> and get the brown and, people. The brown people. <laughs> and get me a gun. Right. Yeah. And get me a gun. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. Right? See, look at you guys. You took simple truth. She read the book like a Bible and you started making fun. Basically, using associations to the but what what do other people do that read the Bible or say that say they read the Bible? They don't listen to it, right? Yeah. And then exactly. she sent it and did the opt. Then she I went think she, the meant, she read it and is trying to find uh, use the use the points yeah. in there. I, well, no, I it's. Yeah. I mean, like like look, I've read it twice and I kind of need to read it a third time. And she's like, uh, I read the Bible. Now I just use it for exorcisms mm. <laughs> or rolling papers. <laughs> yeah. it's perfect paper right that's what, i remember hey. a kid in middle school told me that and it's i've always remembered that for some reason dude see, what are you I, doing i'm smoking matthew 6 5 yeah it's lit burning not colors. like the hypocrites and praying the street corners and in the synagogues to be seen of men but pray in private in thy closet and thou shalt be rewarded openly <laughs> 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 i'm a philosopher <laughs> <laughs> Like, <laughs> so you what, guys are so much fun dude, every time every time we connect we got yeah we got to figure out yeah we, we got to keep doing more together and keep building this Absolutely, synergy man. there's so much overlap like right. i can't i've lost count of the amount of people who are like i found you through jerry corley or you and jerry Cor like there's just so many there's just so much overlap i i don't know why like we'll, we'll have to figure out more ways to combine forces for well, good without a doubt man without a doubt because uh, it does work and it also mm -hmm. teaches a lesson not only to other comics that you don't have to shy away from it you can be at an open mic and laugh at somebody else's joke and it yeah. doesn't take anything away from you yeah it mm -hmm. doesn't make you less funny if you're out there going oh dude that's great it doesn't make you less funny Yep. It just makes you supportive of other comedians and other artists. And trust me, this comes back in a big way later on. It's a small business. And be nice to everybody on the way up. You meet the same people on the way down, unless you're Betty White, because there's no way down. You just stay up there. Yeah, right? up. She's never not been a star. But that so also because, means... You know why? She's so nice to everybody. Right. But that also means when we're at the open mics, we should pay attention to one, one another than worrying about our own shit. Do your homework at home. Yeah, that's what I'm worried. I'm 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 hoping that as comedy scenes open back up, like I'm hoping members of the hot breath of verse who have been absorbing this positivity and this community and this support, I'm hoping it starts to seep into the comedy scenes that people go back to. Cause we've been online, we've been insulated, and it's all been positive, supportive. I'm hoping that starts to seep into the comedy scenes people go back into because I mean, there's enough for everyone and like, like rising tides raise all boats. And it's just the more supportive we can be. I mean, when I started, it was just, they also struggles. drown people. Uh, okay. Well, we can go that way as well. I was, like, I was, listening, I was listening to Joel yeah. throw out all these metaphors and euphemisms. <laughs> like, 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 Hey, there's gotta be, to be all philosophical. And then you threw a punchline in there. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. No, but you're so right, man. It's like, it's like, 
if positivity breeds positivity, yes, and it cre it 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 actually creates more opportunities. Like if everybody's positive together and you're in a room and you're sharing jokes, you're sharing ideas, you're not holding back and you're like, hey, try this. Hey, try this. Here's something that a lot of people don't realize. And here's a little here's a little gift, something you'll never hear in any comedy class or in any book. Nobody's talking about it. The difference between a set working and a set not working when you're doing the same material could be one thing. And that's in that first set where it worked, you established community. You made people feel like they were a part of your show with you on a show, in a conversation with your show. The other part, the, the second part, where maybe didn't work, you were trying to repeat the first night and rather than really be with the audience. And there's so many different ways to create community. But um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Tyler uh, Taylor Tomlinson does this brilliant thing at the beginning. I don't think she knows she's actually doing this on a conscious level, but it is brilliant way of creating community. She walks out, there's her second special, and she's blowing up. She's terrific. I love mm -hmm. her. Right, she walks out on stage and the audience is cheering. And she's like. And as she does that, they cheer more because they say, we're getting a reaction out of here. Let's do this some more. Right. And they cheer more. And then she says, wow, you guys are great. I hope my ex sees this. And they all go, we'll get them. Let's do this together. Yeah. She's wow. got him eating out of the palm of her hand the rest of the show. She just created community. So it's like, think about that. How can you bring them in? How can you bring them in? One of my students did. She's like, she does, hi, y'all. She gets up there and says, hi, y'all. And she's dressed stylishly, right? So we don't expect, hi, y'all. We, you know, she looks like she's a city girl, right? So she, hi, y'all. And the audience giggles. And some guy had a weird giggle. And she's got a weird giggle. And she goes, <laughs> I'm taking you. Yes, you got a great laugh. I'm taking you on the road with me. And the audience applauds that. Why do they applaud? Because you made them feel accepted. You created community. And now they were with her for the rest of the show. They were rooting for her for the rest of the show. The second time she did that, she forgot to create community. She just went in. I'm going to do exactly what I did last week. And she did the jokes, but she forgot to connect. And that's where the audience, humans beings, human beings connect through emotion. That's why we want to be together. It's like we we love that community. Bring and that's where synergy comes into play. Synergize with your audience. Boom. Wow. That's see, that's I gave that away for free. I didn't hold back. <laughs> you didn't have to go to my book to get that. I'll give away shit all day because you I still want clarification. We didn't have to go spend a hundred dollars on a class. When that happened, I was just like, really, dude. A single do you think not answering someone's question? Is going to make them want to go buy it from you. <laughs> it's and like not, it was a simple opposite. question. If you answered it, they probably would have gone and gotten yeah. you because you're a yeah. trusted resource. Yeah, it was a yeah. simple, simple question. I think it's like a simple technique question. And it was, yeah. I I can't give that away. You have to go take my class. Give yeah. me money. But that's hey, you know, to each their own. And uh, I'm glad that um Jerry was the headliner. And speaking of synergy, you just started a podcast with a member of the Hot Breath Diverse, Ashley Gutermuth. You guys started Ashley a podcast. She is wonderful. She's like um she actually co-hosts my a la carte classes. And uh so uh, because you know you you need to sort of regulate the noise sometimes and turn off the mics if somebody's got a dog barking or something in the background. And uh she's terrific. She is like she is immersed. And she is like, it's not years, the years you put in, it's the hours of practice you put in. And mm. she's working on it every single day. She's going to, she's going to be a star and she's smart and she's helpful, Help. helps out people like crazy. She's just a really good comedy soul. And it's like the way I talk about it, you think I'm hitting on her, but no, I'm not messing with her Colonel husband. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but she's just such a good person. And it's yep. like, um, we got to get back to our podcast. You know, she might be too busy to be doing it. She's got so busy. So it's like that I'll just have to do mine on my own. And then, uh, you know, have to go, hey, uh, we're going to be talking to Joel Brill and, and Bo next week. So those are, we're going to have a three way podcast. Uh, now I'm we're always co hosts. We're like, who's the co host? We're co hosts. Yeah. Co -hosts. Oh, I'm always open it. to starting another podcast because I've already <laughs> had three. Information, information, information. People love it. And yep. hey. if, it, if it helps, then that's positive. Yes. Where yeah, can people... and, and I like that because in the end, comedy wins. Yeah. Preach. Now we're just, yeah, now we're proselytizing. So, think, think about, um, so you're about to ask a question. So where can, 
Oh, I was just, you were talking about information and I was going to segue, well, where can people get more of your information? Like it says that right on that thing for more information on Jerry's classes and clinics, go to, you guys have a Chiron and everything. Look at that. Right? You have the lower third in there, Look like more information that. on Jerry's classes and clinics, go to standupcomedyclinic.com. You yeah. like how I said that? Go to standupcomedyclinic.com. <laughs> That's all I can tell. I'm not going to tell clinic. you any more information. You have to buy something. <laughs> you killed <laughs> it. And or visit me on Twitter. And not to and mention, if you have a question, come to Twitter and ask questions yeah. like hashtag joke doctor, all one word. And it's like people ask me questions all the time. But the good thing is to put it in the feed yeah. because then other people learn as well. It becomes a community. And it's like sometimes people ask me questions and one of the other participants says, hey, do you mind if I jump in and try to help? Sure, man. Every time you teach, it helps you to get better. I and, and I could say before I even knew Hot Breath existed, I mean, and when I first found Jerry, I had put stuff in the Twitter and you've helped me out. So and then, of course, there's the shitload of videos you have on YouTube that's free. Yeah. And that's been quite helpful with repairing jokes or how to deal with hecklers, which is always a big question. I know every new comic has is how do I deal with this asshole? You know? Yeah. So when, are, yeah. when are you, when you going to start filming again, Jerry? Um, um, I might, I might, uh, I'm probably going to start next week. I'm going to get a, um, you know, when, when I, the thing is like habit, right? I realized how I was affected by habit and the habit getting smashed. Like I had my studio. I no longer have that studio. Mm. Um, because I had to shut it down, um, because the owner of the studio, the landlord, uh, my lease ran up right at the end of February last year when the pandemic was kicking in. And he was like, He'd been trying to get rid of me for a while because I was locked into a nice rent uh, for five years. And I was had, at the place 10 years and he didn't raise the rent after five years. So I was locked into a really nice rate. Then all of a sudden he wanted to get more money. But instead of just asking me, hey, I want to double the, the rent because the rents around the area had go, the same place was like three thousand dollars. And he was charging me much less than that. So he was he said, but he was like. Okay, you're terminated. You we're, we're terminating your occupancy. You have to get out. I've got a new tenant. I was like, "What? Where's this coming from, dude?" And it was like, um, it was the dad that that was his place. He was like 80 now, and now his son was taken over, the fiery guy. And he was like, um, he's now looking to maximize his profits, you know, rather than mm. let's help some people out. Yeah. And he basically pulled the rug out from under me, and didn't even barely gave me time to get out of there. I was I was down in Florida knocking on doors for Joe Biden when they were kicking us, kicking me out. And one of my students, Terry, Terry S, she's a comedian. She probably done the right 10 as well. She's the one that stepped up and helped me move the shit. She got a truck and just did everything for me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, without her shit, I don't know what I, where I'd be. She's amazing. And it's like, but this is part of the synergy. When you yep. give, 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 and you help, yep. help, 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 mm -hmm. help. People are more like, Hey, you need some help. I'll help you with this. I said, yeah, I'm not even getting home for three days. This guy says he's going to take my shit out tomorrow. Right. Yeah, that's I was thinking because like I'll um I'm getting my second vaccination next week and I, I was planning to make a trip out to L.A. because I have a friend that lives out there. Um, and I was like, we should synergize. And so, yeah, man, let's do that. And I may be maybe doing a crop of crossover to teach my classes in person at this new comedy club called the Comedy Chateau, um, oh. which is one of my Ooh. students. Um, yeah, actually like I always put out the dream to people that it's like one day I would love to buy the comedy store. And, um, so I put that out there and he comes to me, he's a lawyer. He comes up to me going, say, Hey Jerry. And he's got this very interesting cartoon face, right? A great character face. He goes, Jerry, you, you still want to buy a comedy club? I'm buying this building. I'm going to turn it into a comedy club. You want in? <sighs> and my wife was like, no, now's not the time. We still have Keith's finishing up law school. We can't put any money into anything else right now. It's like, you got it. You know, you're the pilot. You drive this plane. Wow. So um, she's actually an airline pilot. So uh, uh, she uh, she put her foot down. I was like, nope. I said, now I'm going to make fun of you. Um, Ex explains yeah. the girlfriend. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, um, see, exactly. So she was. But I knew, yeah, she's right. Because that was that was like September, October of 2019. What kicked in in 2020? A year of no business yeah, <laughs> wow. on a very expensive piece of land, uh, you know, real estate. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but he stayed with it and he kept it. He kept it. He's he's been up, you know, upgrading the facility and the beautiful restaurant, beautiful club, and he's he's uh, it's just opened. And um, so, I'm hopefully going to be able to do some uh, cooperative crossovers there uh, and do classes there. But we'll see, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I'll it's still a great know. club, and I'm I'll help him out any way I can. 
Mm-hmm. So maybe we can we can synergize there and do something. That would be fun. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely um I'll let you know when my plans are for actually getting out there. But I definitely I'm I, I got I'm itching, man. I gotta I gotta get moving again. It's been mm-hmm. so long since I've been like out and about. So I'm excited. So all I know is you said California, and I heard home sweet home. No. <laughs> are you no, from California? Right where are you, where are you, Bo? So I'm originally from Salinas. Oh, cool! Right on. Yeah, and uh, it's it's been a while since I've been home, but yeah, I grew up I grew up around all those lettuce fields, and uh, yeah, got my ass kicked by a lot of gangs, and <laughs> can make fun of it now. So you know, actually, that's kind of funny. I actually had a school bully find out I was a comedian and message me and goes, "Please don't ever put me in a joke." Oh yeah, all right. You're, you're joke you're number next. one, baby. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> yep. That's always fun, right? Yep. Maybe, Get to uh, make fun of people that end with a dab. Have you ever dab before, Jerry? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. You dab this ah! one. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and the key is like the the arms have to be like parallel. Yeah. Can you get them parallel? I don't know. Does it work? Yeah, like, yeah, can you right. do that? You can give a little mm. peek, like a pose. Yeah, get a, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. real quick, Sandy does want to know: Is Jerry going to keep doing online classes? That's a great question because I got I've got this question with me a la carte classes. People were worried who were be able who were able to access the classes out of this out of state that didn't live in Burbank, and I was like, absolutely. Uh, because we're reaching people around the world with the a la carte classes. Yeah, that's and it's great. like, and it's just so exciting to have somebody on, you know, from Austria talking to you and learning something. And that's really, yeah. So absolutely. I'm going to continue doing those. And I might be adding a new type of, um, you know, sort of like something I was thinking about right light Wednesdays is like, I like to take comedians like uh, Seinfeld or Bill Burr or, you know, um, Chris Rock and, uh, or Bill Hicks. And then, um, show how, what techniques they use to so write like Bill Hicks, how to write like Bill Burr, how to write like Jerry Seinfeld, and show the little tricks and nuances they use in their structures. And those oh, seem yeah. to be, I've done three of those, and they seem to be really popular. So I might just make that a, a standalone class once a week, just add new comedians was- and um, help people identify the, the, the structures and and techniques they're using to get to generate their laughs. It was actually an idea I had for a podcast. The first one I wanted to do, but I've never got off is like the history of comedy with comedians and their the way what made them them basically. So, but that's in awesome. that's a very interesting. Now the history class. is great though because the history I tell comedians read as many biographies or autobiographies mm-hmm. you can of comedians. You'll find that you they're going they went through the same stuff that you're going through. Yeah. You know? So you don't feel so lost. Don't feel so alone. You're like, oh, they went through this. If they did it, I can do it. Yep. You know? Somebody said this is where they usually tell uh, Jerry, this is where people need a pee break. Um, yes. Yeah, who said that? That's all right. That might be Phyllis or Ashley. <clears throat> Yeah, or, let's or let's Peter. let's land the plane. I, I told my wife seven and it's seven fifty. I'm on my first marriage. I know Jerry <laughs> said he did a couple marriages with comedy, but I'm I'm I right. don't have I'm four years in. I gotta hold on for a little bit. That was good. Oh, it just says Facebook Facebook user. Yeah, they so, didn't um, they didn't, they didn't agree to StreamYard servicing to show their name. That's kind of uh, that's know, okay. That, that, that kind of thing gets you kicked off of Twitter. Yeah, show your name. And besides, when you show your name, you're synergizing. Boom. So, right. um, so, uh, so, joke doc, uh, basically, twitter.com forward slash joke doctor or standupcomedyclinic.com. If you want to directly communicate, Twitter's the best way. And it's like, um, like during the holiday, I took a little break from Twitter, but, um, uh, I'm usually on there a lot and trying to answer questions when I can because I love doing it. Just love it. I can go down the rabbit hole with that. Because yeah. it's super creative. It's not just me complaining about, oh well, yeah, this sucks. Or like, it's like, uh, commu- It's creative. So it's mm-hmm. adds to your writing time. All right, awesome. So wrap well, it up. Let's wrap it up. All how, right. do we, how do we end this? Is there an end button? Is there? A, uh, do we have a stinger? There is an end button. My mouse is right over it, y'all. We give each other the light. We give, yeah, we <laughs> give the one minute, y'all. This has been the comedy book series, uh, Hot Breath Pro Talks with the joke doctor Jerry Corley. I am comedian Bo Johnson. That is comedian uh, Joel Byers. Joel Byers, yes. Joel Joel Byers, Byers. the the hot breath godfather. And (laughs) we will see you next time. Peace. Peace.